of this conference on Dionysus um, religion and politics and I have the pleasure of chairing this session and introducing introducing uh, Professor Richard Seaford, Emeritus Professor um, of Classics and, and Ancient History at the University of Exeter. We all know uh, his, his work. He has uh, extensively uh, written on Greek literature and religion, uh, drama, uh, well, uh, economic history also in relation with philosophy. Uh, his uh, most famous books are perhaps uh, Reciprocity and Ritual from uh, 1994, Money and the Early Greek Mind, 2004, uh, Cosmology and the Police, 2012. Uh, as, as I said, we, we all know, and uh, uh, his work is, person personally, I, I use it uh, with my students in Spain. They often complain in the first year that it's not translated into, into Spanish, so I hope uh, <laughs> a Spanish translation can come uh, soon of some of his, of these volumes. Uh, and, uh, well, um, uh, I'm very happy to be able to of introducing him today and, and presenting his, his conference, his, his conference on the cult of Dionysus. Uh, the title uh, is a, uh, well, religion and politics in Euripides back here. I didn't comment that uh, he has uh, written also co uh, two comments on uh, Euripides works, uh, Cyclops and, and Bacchae, uh, a very influential com uh, commentary. And I will, I, I hope, I, I, I know that we will uh, all enjoy very much his, his talk this, this afternoon. So, uh, Professor, Professor Seaford, thank you very much. And you have uh, the floor. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm very grateful for the invitation, particularly as it seems to me that the politics of Dionysus has been So this is a very good theme. Now, I'm going to talk about Euripides' Bacchae, and I have written this commentary on the Bacchae, and the Bacchae has been subject to endless scholarship and interpretation, but there are, I think, new things to be said, particularly in the realm of politics, which is like the politics has been neglected in the study of Dionysiac cult generally, so particularly it has, I think, also in the study of the Bacchae, and I am guilty of that too in my commentary. I didn't say as much about the politics as I should have done. Now, a certain amount of what I'm going to say is unfortunately negative because I'm going to attack a preconceived conception of the Bacchae and of Dionysiac cult, which is extraordinarily widespread. It is what I call a metaphysical preconception. The preconception is that the Bacchae is about irresolvable <coughs> contradiction. That's the preconception. And if I say, as I'm going to, that that is nonsense. It's rather like if you, if you were to go to Byzantium in the 14th century and maintain the truth of the Western conception of the Trinity, you wouldn't get very far. You would be considered to be a heretic. But there's not much you could do about it because everybody believes in the Greek Orthodox conception of the Trinity. It really is a... a, a if I were to do, go to a conference in North America and give this paper, people would think I would be slightly mad. Um, because it's a kind of groupthink. It's a kind of collective feeling that this is what the play is about. And for me, it's not just nonsense. It is destructive nonsense and the kind of nonsense that gets in the way of us understanding what this play is really about. And it's an even more fascinating play that, than people think. One of the problems about the preconception of irresolvable contradiction, as I call it, is it's actually very boring, <laughs> quite apart from the fact that it has nothing to do with the play at all, as we will see, I hope, as we go on. The Bacchae is about the arrival of the god Dionysus in Thebes, his rejection by the king of Thebes, Pentheus, and his family, and the victory of Dionysus over Pentheus, and the ultimate establishment of the cult of Dionysus at Thebes. That is what Dionysus says he's going to do when he comes in disguise and delivers the prologue. Now, the resistance of Pentheus leads eventually to violent conflict in which Pentheus is torn apart by his own mother and her female associates who have been sent to the mountainside by the god Dionysus 
in an ecstasy to perform ritual and dancing in his cult as a prefiguration of what will happen every year in a more controlled way in the performance of the cult of Dionysus. That's what happens in the play, but probably many of you know already what happens in that play. And at the end you see a very cruel scene in which Agawe, who's in a frenzy, comes back from the mountains carrying the head of her son and thinking it's the head of a lion that she's just torn apart. She's gradually brought to believe that this is in fact the head of her son. Um, and Dionysus appears ex machina at the end of the play, the god himself, and says, well, you rejected me. This is what I've done to take my revenge on you and establish the cult of Dionysus in Thebes. And he um, says to the uh, royal family, you have to go into exile. But clearly he also says, my cult is now established in Thebes. So that is 100% certain, even though unfortunately <coughs> that part of the play has been lost. But it is 100, not 99%, 100% certain that he does what he said he would do in the prologue, which is to establish his cult in Thebes. So this is, this is the dramatization of what is called an ideological myth. The Greeks performed cult, and if you ask them, why are you performing this cult, they would tell you a story that a long time ago, this is what happened. And very often that ideological myth involves resistance to the cult. Initially there is resistance to the cult, but finally the resistance is overcome and the cult is established. There are many, many examples of this. Now I want to turn to this stuff on the handout, produced by eminent scholars, and just go through some of these passages. Um, and this all embodies the same basic metaphysical preconception which gets in the way of understanding this play. In one sense, the play is quite simple. The play is telling you that the cult of Dionysus must not be resisted, that everybody must join in. And the play was actually written for and produced at a festival of Dionysus because Dionysus was the god of drama who brought everybody together in the city to watch these dramas or at least participate in these great processions through the city that preceded the dramas. So um, uh, that is what the play is about and it's about the, the, uh, the resistance to that initially by Pentheus who incidentally is not a tragic hero there's no such thing as a tragic hero. Let me repeat that, just in case you think I'm slightly crazy. There is no such thing as a tragic hero. The word hero in tragedy hardly occurs, and it never refers to a living human being. It's only a dead person who receives cult. Aristotle in the Poetics doesn't talk about the tragic hero. It's invented in the Renaissance, but it gets in the way again, of our understanding tragedy, because we think that the individual at the centre of tragedy is somehow heroic. No, the individual at the centre of tragedy is very often called a tyrannos. Over 150 times you get that word or its cognates. Tyrannos means tyrant. So we shouldn't talk about tragic heroes, we should talk about tragic tyrants. The reason it's called hero is a, either a, a result or a, certainly a cause of a kind of depoliticization of tragedy. You remove the element of tyranny from it. You call, it, you call the person a hero. It's nonsense. There is no such thing as a tragic hero. Uh, right, now, um, here we have Donald Mastronardi, who's, who works in California, written a big book on Euripides. Philip said earlier, apropos of the last presentation, he said, if you only read literature, you miss a lot. Well, that's for sure. And that's particularly true in the cult of Dionysus. And these are people, particularly in North America, who only read literature. I really assure you, this is, this is what it's like. They fetishize it. They make it into something which is entirely self-contained. And it makes it a lot easier, by the way, and it gives them their subject. This is literature, and I'm not going to hear of all this other stuff. And that's the kind of organization of the academy, particularly in North America. <coughs> um, so here's Mastronade. The tragic dilemma it, the Baki, presents is that one must both acknowledge Dionysus' divinity and recognize the gods' potential for cruel violence and amoral excess. 
Now, this is a problem within the cult of Dionysus. The cult of Dionysus, he's saying, is ambivalent. You have to accept Dionysus because he's a god, but he is very cruel. So you have what he calls a dilemma. There is no dilemma. This is a man who hasn't made the first effort to understand Greek religion. The point about Greek religion is that if you ignore a god or reject a god, they will destroy you. It's simple. That's how it works, right? That's true of every god. There's no dilemma, Donald. This is ridiculous. This is absolutely absurd. And of course, Dionysus, Dionysus destroys his enemies because they have rejected him totally. This is what happens. Right, so there's Mastronale. Now, Charles Siegel, who belongs to the same school of literature-only criticism. The relation of civilized humanity to Dionysus and to all that Dionysus symbolizes is necessarily ambiguous. The Bacchae explores that ambiguity in its tragic dimension and in its relation to tragedy. It is an oversimplification to view the play as a statement either for or against Dionysus and his cult. People in North America and generally find that enormously appealing. No need to make your mind up, well, about anything really, but particularly not the cult of Dionysus. It's ambivalent. It's ambiguous. Anybody who says that this shows the cult of Dionysus is bad or good is oversimplifying the worst sin that an academic can be guilty of. Oversimplification. The complex will always trump the simple in the mind of these people. Okay. Now there's Winnington Ingram. Winnington Ingram is a rather different kind of person. To be sure, he's a literature-only person, um, but he's British for a start. And secondly, he's an older generation. Anybody less um, likely to come from a, a background favorable to Dionysiac cult, you can't imagine. His father was an admiral, and his uncle was an Anglican bishop. Such people do not like ecstatic religion. And moreover, he experienced the, first, the Second World War, and in his preface, he refers to, what, to Nazism. And he's thinking of the Nuremberg rallies and so on as one of the terrible examples of a kind of group ecstasy. So Nazism has combined with his, his uh, upbringing to produce an antipathy to a Dionysiac cult. And he says, the choral Maenads, that's, those are the Maenads that have been sent onto the mountainside, are attempting to introduce their worship into a civilized community to which the Dionysiac in its pure form is inimical. And he gives us an example of that. The, the villagers, the, the Theban Maenads, I'm sorry, the choral Maenads are the, the people actually in front of you on stage who've come with Dionysus to Thebes. The Theban Maenads are out on the mountainside and they've attacked certain villages. And it's those Maenads who are um, uh, described by Winnington Ingram as the enemies of organized society. So he's pursuing the ambivalence. It's perhaps not even ambivalence. He just thinks that Dionysiac cult is shown in Euripides to be an enemy to civilized society and a terrible thing generally. What he doesn't mention, again, is the fact that these minads on the mountainside are actually performing the cult very peacefully. They, they're described as a thauma eucosmias, a miracle of good order. A honey and milk and wine are flowing from the ground and so on, and, and they're having a lovely peaceful time. But then they're attacked. They're attacked by some men who want to gratify the Turanos Pentheus because Pentheus is rejecting the Dionysian cult. And it's because they're attacked that they attack in return. And indeed, they defeat the men. These are women who defeat the men. They're attacking the villages. And Winnington Ingram just leaves that out. That's, they only attack the villages because they are being attacked. Once again, it's a bad idea to attack religious ritual. It's a bad idea to attack a god. Now, this is sort of obvious. Um, but the preconceptions are much more powerful than the evidence, as, as always. In fact, I mean, there are other myths of this kind. For example, it was said that at the Thesmophoria, which was a festival of Demeter, a king, Battus, spied on them, on the women. No men were allowed <coughs> in this ritual. 
one of those women-only ritual that Battus uh, spied on them and was grabbed by the women and castrated. Well, nobody says that this means that the cult of Demeter was somehow inimical to civilization. That's what happens to you if you spy on the women. Uh, you, there have to be these sanctions that women actually maintain against men who intrude on their rituals. That would be regarded as perfectly reasonable. Okay. Now we come on, in passage four, to the most sophisticated of the uh, embodiments of the PIC, the preconception of irresolvable contradiction. Because this man does know about religion. This is Hank Fleschnell. He's very good, actually, in certain respects, in writing about Greek religion. And he has a new take on the Baki. And he, what he's noticed, interestingly, is that in Athens in the 5th and 4th centuries BC, there were a number of new cults introduced of foreign deities, Kibbele, Bendis, Sabasius, Isodites, and so on. And some of them we know uh, from sources, older sources, or sometimes it's later sources like Scoliasts, is that um, they're, they're initially resisted. There is hostility to these cults by the <laughs> Athenians because of certain goings on. They think they involve drunkenness and immorality and sex and so on. And the action is taken against them. Um, however, in almost all cases, they are nevertheless established, the cult of Kibbele was established, had an official position eventually after the priest of Kibbele who arrived was killed by the Athenians and was then a plague and an oracle was consulted and they said you must establish the cult, so the cult of Kibbele was established after the initial resistance. That's an ideological myth, it doesn't look like history to me, something similar may have happened but that's an example of an ideological myth. God, foreign deities introduced resistance, violence against the priest, plague, followed by oracle, followed by the establishment of the cult. And there are a number of other cults of this kind. And Chanel says, quite rightly, well, actually what Pentheus says is rather like what these Athenians were saying. This new cult involves sex and drunkenness and general immorality and disorder and so on and so forth. That's fine. And after all, the Baki dramatizes an ideological myth. But he then loses sense completely, and passage 4 shows this. He says, the Bacchae pictures Dionysus as a new daimon, who being outlawed by the city officials, turns out to be a real great god, and thus proves res resistance to be Hamartia. Now that's right, except, except there are no city officials in the Bacchae, but allowing that small error, the rest of it is perfectly correct. It turns out to be a Hamartia, or a sin, or at least a big mistake, to resist Dionysus because he is indeed a real great god. Then on the next page, about two sentences later, he says, the tragic paradox lies in the fact that both parties are right. No, no, it doesn't. Some, suddenly you get this metaphysical preconception coming in. No, 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 Pentheus resisted the great god. He wasn't right. He was wrong. It's really quite simple. So how can Fischnell conceivably say, well, it was clearly, it was clearly wrong, that's what the word hamartia means, to resist him, but nevertheless both parties are right. How can that be? Because of the power of preconception. Now, I know what he means. He's pointing to the interesting fact that Pentheus says the sort of things that some Athenians might have said, when Kibbele arrived, or when Bendis arrived, and so on and so forth. But as far as this play is concerned, it's ludicrous to say that both parties are right. Well, what, so what, what's Euripides trying to do? Euripides, he says, intended to leave us with a sense of uncertainty. Why? Now, this is absolutely fashionable in certain circles about Greek tragedy. It's all interrogative. You end with uncertainty, aporia. It's all interrogative. It doesn't provide any answers. It doesn't say anything. Oh, horror. What a horror would be if actually said anything. No, it's all interrogative. These people tend to adopt this principle generally in politics and so on and so forth. They certainly adopt it ferociously when it comes to Greek tragedy. The Oresteia ends with a big question mark. That's what these Athenians really want, you see, because they're, it's true that their polis is 
disintegrating and they're quite likely to all to be slaughtered and so on. But nevertheless, what they really like is going to the theatre and being presented with unanswerable questions. That's according to these people. <coughs> that's what Euripides and Aeschylus are interested in. And that's what the tragedies give you. And it is total nonsense. Now, um, here, to fo follow it up more closely, Fersnell says, paradox is the opposition between the wisdom of accepting Dionysus, he uses the word paradox, and another wisdom, here we go, the sophrosume, that's moderation, self-control, the sophrosume of Pentheus, who represents the equally credible and justifiable civic resistance to a new religion that shakes the pillar of society. Well, no, no, it, it just, this is not a justifiable civic resistance, it's a big mistake, it is not justifiable. He thinks it's justifiable, and it resembles some things that Athenians may have said about gods who were eventually, of course, accepted as Dionysus is, but it is not justifiable. There is no paradox whatsoever. But he uses the word sophrosume. Limit, now, if we, I looked up the occurrence of the word sophro. Sophrosume doesn't fit into the meter metrically, but you have this word sophro, which the word sophrosume comes from, which means moderate, self-controlled, self-limiting. It occurs in the Bacchae ten times. Not once is it used of Pentheus. It, most of the occurrences are about the Dionysiac cult itself, as being so thrown. In some cases, somebody's wishing Pentheus was more so thrown, um, who clearly isn't so thrown. And uh, there are passages, two passages where the messenger is saying, the Minads, they're so thrown, not as you think, they're not getting drunk, they're so thrown. So all the sophrosyme attack, attack attaches to the cult, and none of it attacks, mm -hmm. attaches to Pentheus. And yet we have Fischnell saying there is the sophrosome of Pentheus. What is he talking about? Pentheus appears on stage initially, and as he appears on stage, it's said of him, hos eptoetai, what a flutter is he in? And he then delivers this rant against Dionysus. He then tries to lock Dionysus up. He gets into an extraordinary... Um, uh, process which is, occurs inside the house, which is described, which he rushes around, calling for water, jabbing <coughs> at, at, at lights, and, and so on. Pentheus is the opposite of Sophrone, of Sophrone from the beginning. The chorus are the embodiment of Sophrosome. And, of course, the part of the preconception is to imagine that ecstatic dancing is... Um, somehow the opposite of Sophra, Dionysiac dancing, you see it on vast paintings, is the opposite of Sophra. And anybody who's ruling a, 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 a city-state must somehow embody civic order. And that, that, that's a sort of deep, unconscious political preconception. So what is Pentheus, then? Pentheus, as I say, is not a hero. He is a Turanos. He's called a Turanos. And as everybody says in another play, there's nothing more hostile to a polis than a Turanos. When Pentheus is dead, his grandfather Cadmus delivers a eulogy of him, in which he not once says Pentheus was a good ruler, not once does he say he, he kept order in the polis. He says, you looked after me, your grandfather, and you were a tarbos to the polis, you were a terror to the polis. That's Pentheus's relationship to the polis. The Athenians were extremely hostile to tyranny all the way through the 5th century. There are endless texts in which they express their fear and detestation of tyranny. That should be borne in mind when you see all these tragic characters called Tyrannos. In fact, in the very festival in which the dramas were performed, they had an announcement all the way through until at least the time of Aristophanes, who mentions it, offering a reward to anybody who kills the Tyrannoi. That's at the dramatic festival. That's incredible. Um, so, so that's, that's uh, for Schnell. Um, so you have then an uh, irresolvable contradiction, supposedly, between Pentheus is supposed to embody civic order and the Dionysiac cult is somehow opposed to it. Um, and that's an irresolvable contradiction because Dionysus is also God. And then you um, also have this contradiction even within Dionysiac cult. 
And both those contradictions are pure illusion. Neither of those contradictions are irresolvable. Of course, ambivalence and contradiction is important in tragedy, but it is almost always functional. It has a point. It's not there just to be celebrated as contradiction. Right. Now, um, one more passage before I end up with Nietzsche. This is passage five. Dionysus represents power that has to be both abhorred and worshipped. This tragic situation is made clear in Euripides' Bacchae. A Gawi completely surrenders herself to the god and is punished by unwittingly slaying her son and being banished, while the opposite attitude of Pentheus, who resists the god, leads to his violent death. Perfect example of the preconception of irresolvable contradiction from Eudemans and Ladinla, who are Dutch. Now, um, he says, it looks impressive, that a Gawi completely surrenders herself to the god and is punished by unwittingly slaying her son. That looks unfair, doesn't it? That, that tells you that Dionysus is implacable, cruel, and irrational. He punishes the people who follow him. Unfortunately, they've omitted to notice an absolutely crucial passage in the prologue of the play, which Dionysus comes on and says, <coughs> I've been rejected here. And in particular, he says, well, Pentheus is rejecting me, but also my mother's sisters. And he means Agawi and her sisters. They rejected me, and they, they said that when their sister Semele said that she'd had sex with Zeus and I was the product of it, they didn't believe her. And they said that she'd had sex with some man and made up the story that she'd had sex with Zeus. Actually, of course, that's not an unreasonable thing to think. But in this case, it's manifestly untrue. Dionysus is the son of Zeus. So Agawi has done the worst possible thing. So have her sisters. He then says, Toigar, therefore, he says, just in order to, as it were, ensure that he wouldn't be understood 2,000 years later by people like Adamans and Ludenwa, he says, therefore, I have driven them crazy and set them up onto the mountainside. So the idea that Agawi is somehow innocent is preposterous. So once again, you've got nonsense in the interests of the preconception of irresolvable contradiction. And until I get to Nietzsche, that's uh, my last passage. Of course, what happens in the play is that the royal family are exiled, the tyrannical family are exiled, and the polis gets the benefit of the cult. That's a very common ending for Greek tragedy. Now, the um, thing that in my commentary I didn't pay enough attention to was the immediate political circumstances of the play, which I think strengthens my case that the Athenians are not as interested in irresolvable contradiction as people like Charles Siegel are. Uh, the fact is that Euripides died in the winter of 407 to 406 BCE. And this play was one of his very last plays. It was never produced in his lifetime. It was produced after he died. But we don't know where and when. Probably in Athens, but we don't know when. But he wrote it almost certainly in the years after 412, 407. And that was after the catastrophic Sicilian expedition in which thereafter Athens was plunged for all those years into severe internal conflict, which represented an existential threat because the Spartans were ready to come in and destroy them. They needed to be united, but they couldn't manage to be united. They were divided into the rich against the poor. There were constitutional changes, and eventually in 404, a group of 30 people seized power. After Euripides died, but a natural consequence of what was going on. And there's one episode described by Xenophon, which is, nobody's noticed, actually very important, I think, for understanding the battle. Because there's a battle between the supporters of the 30, who, were called, who Xenophon says they thought they could tyrannize. They thought they could behave like Turinoi, like tyrants, these 30 people. And then on the other side, there are Democrats. And they come to, to have a battle. Um, and Xenophon described, the Democrats win it, actually, in the end. It's the beginning of the end of the 30. But uh, <coughs> Xenophon describes the battle. And after the battle, they, they kind of start, the two sides start talking to each other. I mean, they share a language and a culture. 
And you can imagine, first of all, they fight to a standstill, then they start talking to each other. And the spokesman for the Democrats is a man called Cleocritos, who is, Xenophon says, the herald of the mysteries, that's the Eleusinian mysteries, in which most Athenians participated, this enormously emotional collective ritual in which people experience death in order to be rid of the fear of death, and they do it together. This creates solidarity. And you may remember a passage of Herodotus in which the Persians have arrived in, in uh, 480 BC, and the Athenians have abandoned their city, left it empty to the Persians, and uh, eventually they defeat the Persians, but this is the moment of existential threat to Athens. In a sense, it no longer exists, and there is a ghostly procession from Eleusis. It's a divine procession in which a great cloud of dust arises as 30,000 people tramp across the plain. The Athenians, it's not the real Athenians, it's a sort of divine or ghostly procession. What it's saying is, of course, that the gods will save Athens, but, of course, it... It, what it means, sociologically, you might say, is it's the rituals that embody the unity, the spirit, the termination, above all, the unity of the people, particularly this very emotional ritual. When Aristophanes, uh, in 405, writes the frogs, he has a chorus of initiates of Eleusis, who, at the end of the play, send up Aeschylus, a tragic poet, from the underworld, to this world in order to save the polis. So tragedy and mystic initiation are both crucial for saving the polis. Now, to get back to Cleocritus, he is a herald of the mysteries, and he says, Xenophon reports, look, we shouldn't be fighting, we're all Athenians, and you, and we share participation in solemn rituals. And he's referring, of course, to the Eleusinian mysteries. So once again, you have there you have an opposition between the, the Turanos, on the one hand, is using violence for tyrannical rule, and the mysteries which unite everybody, on the other hand. And the Baki, of course, is pervaded, secretly often, because they couldn't be revealed, with the morality, the ritual, the ideas of Dionysiac and Eleusinian mystic initiation. That's what the play is about. But mystic initiation has enormous political significance. This stuff about the immediate context of the play, in which the Athenians have better things to think about than irresolvable contradiction, they have got to think about the unity of the polis and how you create it, is all completely ignored in the vast literature on Euripides' Bacchae. Not only by these people, but I actually didn't mention that passage in my commentary. Uh, if it was a second edition, I would do so. Now, um, finally, with metaphysical contradictions, it's always worth thinking, where do they come from? And I just want to end uh, briefly, I hope it's brief, by uh, saying something about this. Because you may know that there's a theory of tragedy associated with the philosopher Hegel in the early 19th century, which puts contradiction at the heart of tragedy. Tragedy is about contradiction, but for Hegel it's about the resolution of one-sided contradictions. They collide and out of it comes something superior. Um, the Antigone is his primary exhibit. Contradiction between the state and the family, that contradiction is at the heart of the Antigone. There's dreadful suffering that results from it, but in the end, you, you arrive at some kind of resolution of the contradiction and a higher level of society. And Hegel, of course, believed that the state was the embodiment of the absolute spirit, and um, he uh, spent most of his life engaged in resolving contradiction. I mean, he was born in 1770. He was 19 when the French Revolution started. He remained loyal to the French Revolution throughout his life, but that meant he was constantly facing a big historical contradiction between, on the one hand, the inherited particularities, privileges, rights, practices of the small German states where he had to live, on the other hand, what he could see in the glorious future, which is the universality 
that arises from the French Revolution and will inform the new modern state. That was precisely the contradiction that he was engaged in and was trying to resolve. And in his attempt to resolve it, he would talk about the one-sidedness of the people who uh, were universalists. They didn't sufficiently recognize the rights of the small states. So his notion of one-sided contradiction is not just part of his theory of tragedy. It's about his profound political engagement. He wrote pamphlets and so on and so forth. Now let's, let's switch to Nietzsche, born in 1844, who is the diametric opposite of Hegel in every respect that I've mentioned. He has a lifelong antipathy to what he calls the state and society, which he regards as merely an obstacle to individualism. He, after he gives up his job in Basel in 1879, where he was a professor of Greek for a few years, he lives a very solitary life, moving with a suitcase from one place to another, never settling down, never, of course, being politically engaged in any sense, being hostile to it in every sense. Of course, he had no relationship with a woman, though apparently he did visit brothels. Um, and he writes The Birth of Tragedy, first in 1872. And The Birth of Tragedy represents, interestingly, what I call the reification of contradiction. You have some examples of it in handout number six. That is to say, contradiction is no longer the contradiction of, say, the state and society on the one hand with the family on the other. Um, it's not a contradiction of anything in particular, it's just contradiction. And incidentally, he says that the state and society <coughs> is completely excluded from the purely religious origins of tragedy. So he wants to separate tragedy on the one hand as a metaphysical phenomenon from the state and society on the other. This is total nonsense. I mean, nobody would believe this now, but this is, you know, he was quite young when he wrote it. Uh, but this is a kind of influential nonsense. Yeah. And, um, of course, there is a, the reification of contradiction means, of course, that it's irresolvable. It's just contradiction. It's what he calls Ur Widerspruch. And you have the passages in front of you on six, in passage six. Um, so contradiction is reified as a thing separate from any particularities. And it's abstract, it's primordial, and above all, it's irresolvable. So there, of course there is a correlation between political disengagement and the taste for irresolvable contradiction, just as there is a correlation between the political engagement of Hegel and his imagining tragedy in terms of resolvable contradiction. And in this respect, Hegel is much more like the ancient Athenians than Nietzsche is, of course. And modern academics, particularly in, North, particularly in North America, I have to say, are in both these respects, both politically and theoretically, much more like Nietzsche. At that point, I end. Thank you. <laughs> Thought-provoking conference, and now we, we have some minutes for a debate. So maybe I'm sure there are questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your comments on the obsession of. Um, showing Kantic philosophy and tragedy as a field of uh, permanent approximation. That's an obsession which shows us how uh, we project nowadays discussions from the epistemological discussion and looking for a, a, for a, a mandate, for a legitimization of that in the ancient, that's true. Uh, I will risk, that's a risk which um, I want to take it's a smooth apology of a tragic dilemma. That's uh, risky, but it's a wolf. I mean, you thought um, back it's an ideological myth. That's true, no doubt. The question is only, only is it only an ideological myth? <laughs> um, or it's something which shows a kind of a permanent temptation. 
because I do agree that for Euripides uh, there is no real dilemma. I mean, um, Dionysus is right and the Pentheus is wrong. It's nothing hidden. Uh, but the story is not only about the past or as about mythical beginning, but I think it's on the permanent temptation to reject Dionysus. Why? Why the temptation exists? Because Dionysus is transcendent. And there is a permanent temptation of rejecting transcendence because of falsely identified political interest. So there is a phenomenon which may be called Pentheus. Pentheus, the human phenomenon. Yes, yes, yes. And the question why and what are the reasons why people follow Pentheon uh, ideas, it's an interesting question, not just a mistake. I mean, it's not only, a, I mean, the play is not only about false and true, it's about a reason why people are false. That's much deeper, I think. Uh, and if the reason are strong, the tragic dilemma exists. It's a, of course, it's a dilemma between false and true, but it's a dilemma between a strong reason uh, and true. Dilemma between those temptations um, and the imperative of the cult exists, definitely. Not because, of course, both sides are right, that's absolute, I do agree. But because people think it is so. And that's, I think, a topic which may help me to advocate a little bit the tragic dilemma idea. Well, I'm very sympathetic to that, to that observation. I don't think it leads you to a dilemma, but nevertheless, I'm very sympathetic to the observation. And I'll make two points in response. Firstly, um, a political point, uh, which is something that relates to what other people may be saying about the role of Dionysus under imperial systems or monarchical systems. What I've said does, I think, complement at least what Cornelia Isla Keren, you said earlier this morning, who, unlike some people, puts Dionysus right at the heart of the city. Well, so do I, of course, but I do it in a different way. Um, but it's this, that when Tiresias is explaining why the cult of Dionysus should be accepted in the city, uh, he says he desires honours from everybody, without distinctions. Alexa Pantone Bulatai Timas Eke very significant, and it's what it, that's something which we know about Dionysiac cult. There's plenty of evidence from Athens itself that everybody joins in. That's why it's so politically important. Everybody <coughs> joins in without distinctions. It is a symbolic expression of the wholeness of the city. He then says, interestingly, to Pentheus, you, Pentheus, you know what it's like. You know what it's like when you're at the city gates and the whole city magnifies the name of Pentheus, Megalune Polis. That's an, politically an enormously important thing to say. He then says, well, Dionysus, he too likes being honored. Karkenos oi my hedatai timomenos. So he's saying, look, there are two individuals here, both of whom want the acclamation all at once of the whole city. And one is Dionysus, and the other is the tyrant <coughs> Pentheus. But the implication is, it isn't drawn out, the implication is it can't be both. The point is, if you're a city, you have to choose either a potentate, a dictator, a tyrannos, a ruler, or an emperor, whom you unite to honor, or a god. And the Athenian democrats, and this is a democracy, they choose a god, and they don't want a tyrannos. They don't want a man, they want a god. They want to be united in acclamation a, sin, a single individual, but not a man, a god. Now, that all breaks down, of course. Already at the end of the 4th century BC, you have an episode in which, uh, in which um, Polio, Demetrius Polyorchetes is at a, in the heart of a ritual in which he's worshipped as if he was a god. And then, from then on, either potentates or kings identify with the god, or more likely they they favor the cult of Dionysus because the cult of Dionysus can bring everybody together. That's what they want as kings or as rulers. And sometimes, as in the case of uh, 
Crassus's, uh, sorry, Plutarch's Life of Antony, which I think Philip is going to talk about Plutarch, uh, Mark Antony enters the city of Ephesus, and it's like a Dionysiac festival with Antony in the place of Dionysus. So that, but that dynamic of Dionysus, the people, and the mighty individual is already there in the back end. So that's an enormously important passage. The other thing I would say is that, yes, because everybody in Athens is a potential Turanos. That's, the, that's how I would put it. Why? Because the Turanos depends on, on control of money. Every individual in Athens has a kind of isolated individualism based on ownership of money. This is a completely new world. You have a new kind of individualism, a new kind of individualism, which is embodied in an extreme form by Pentheus, but also in a lesser form by each individual in the audience, just as we are isolated individuals. And in the, in the way that in pre-monetary society, people are not. Pentheus accuses Tiresias of telling lies for money when he is... Um, offered the sight of the miners on the mountainside. He says, oh, yes, I'd give a lot of money for that. This is the man of money, my dad's like. Um, and so, yes, absolutely. This means something to people, firstly, because they see a Tyrannos being destroyed, which is good, and secondly, because there's a sense in which each and every one of them is a potential Tyrannos. So in that sense, I agree with you completely. That, that's even Plato says that uh, tyranny is a uh, full realization of a democratical idea well, by he, one person. By he one does. Person. I mean, he, actually, he's historically wrong about that in the sense that there was the, the, the only sense in which, um, I mean, he talks about democracy being a sort of a sort of anarchy of many many different ideas, and then one of them, and desires, and then one of them takes over. That is not really how tyr that's not how tyranny came, in, came into being. However. Um, however, I suppose that, that he might be sympathetic to the sort of thing I've just said. He never says anything quite like that. Yes, but I, I take the point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you very much for a really wonderful paper. Um, I once, several years ago, sat down and read all of the introductions to commentaries of Euripides back on and it transpired that they fell into two categories, pro dionysian including Euripides, and pro pentheum including um, the French commentator from 1970 1972. And this reminds me of an inspirational paragraph in an essay by Gian Pietro Conte uh, entitled The Strategy of Contradiction, where he says that when there is disagreement and fundamental disagreement among critics, that this is basically an externalization of a contradiction or a paradox that exists within the text, which has merely taken up residence uh, in the critical debate. So, um, with that in mind, even if all of the critics that you very amusingly satirized have got it wrong, wouldn't you have to accept that they have fallen into a trap uh, that Euripides laid for them? Uh, in particular, that, that already within the play, and I'm thinking in particular of two remarks that Catalyst makes in his uh, argument with the God uh, at the end of the play. They're all, if you like, singing, all of, the, all of the critics, or several of the critics that you talked about, are singing off the, the Catalyst hymn sheet uh, that the God is excessive in his asymmetrical uh, judgment uh, and, and violent response, and that God's um, should, or, or should not resemble um, mortals in their anger. So that's, I suppose, the substance of my point. As a, as a footnote to it, um, if you... I haven't published this yet, but I, I conducted a metacritical analysis, uh, a metacritical comparative analysis of interpretations of Euripides Bacchae and interpretations of Virgil's Aeneid. And there, when you have the killing of Turnus, uh, you have the Harvard School critics, uh, who say that this is terrible, and right? you have the pro critics who say that this is right, and that it's just that it can be justified juridically, philosophically, uh, etc., etc. And it's pretty clear to me that the people who justify the killing of terms have all of the right arguments on their side. But it's also clear to me that even the people on the other side have to acknowledge 
that Verita writes the text in such a way that it's supposed to feel that. We're supposed to feel a pang of resistance uh, or of contradiction or of something of that kind. So this is just a sort of rambling, roundabout way of saying that um, everything that you satirized can also be supported on the basis of the text. Yes, I mean, I'm actually pretty sympathetic to that. I wouldn't dare to pronounce anything about the Aeneid because that's a completely different socio-political context and therefore by my own principles I shouldn't pronounce on the Aeneid. So I'm not going to. <laughs> when it comes to the back, it, you, you, that point about, the, well, this is excessive, but then God's, God shouldn't be like that. I mean, this is made up absolutely clear. Let me say that, of, of course, I um, allow for the importance of contradiction in tragedy. But I also think that tragedy is functional. I mean, I'm not a functionalist in every sense, but I do think it's doing things. And it's doing th two things which you might think, we might think, are contradictory. One is to evoke sympathy for the tyrannical family, right? And the ending does do that, clearly. No doubt about that. And the other is to uh, depict... The, the sins, the excesses, and the, and the welcome demise of the tyrannical family which accompanies the establishment of cult for the whole polis. And it does those two things together. And it's, it, it's kind of having the best, having its cake and eating it. It's what we in England call cakeism these days because it characterizes our relationship to negotiating with the European Union in which we want, the, we want all the benefits and have none of the obligations. Uh, anyway, the Athenians have their own form of cakeism, which is they clearly they feel sympathy for the family, but they also rejoice in their demise. <coughs> and there's a particular reason why that happens, um, and I see nothing, con nothing irresolvably contradictory about that. That seems to me a perfectly resolvable contradiction. And it's not, it's, not really, it's not what these people like Siegel are talking about. They're talking about a sort of abstract thing. Um, but there's a particular reason for that, because the, the, the family um, is either destroyed by the gods or it destroys itself. What you don't have in tragedy is the people rising up and getting rid of the tyrannical family, or one faction within the oligarchy killing another and then becoming rulers. Because if you had that, you, there'd be no closure. That really is no closure. People are obviously banging on about literature not providing closure. It's one of those Californian cliches that we just hear all the time. But um, actually... Serious non-closure is not just the inherent in the text, whatever it is, but actually serious non-closure is a matter of revenge, right? Because if you have a violent act and the survivor and the victor survives, you have a problem. To, even at the end of the Odyssey, you can see it's a problem, which is pre-tragic. And therefore, you cannot have a situation in which a human victor prevails through violence and survives, um, unless, it's, unless the, the victims are barbarians like in, in the Persians. So God has to do it, or somebody within the same family has to do it. Right? So that's how you get closure. But that's also, intrafamilial killing is very pathetic. It's, it's terrible. It, it involves all sorts of emotions that we may have had from children concerning hostility to the people around, the, our kin, our, our mother, our father, our brother, and all the rest of it. So all those emotions can be evoked, but in a framework of political expediency. So I, I, I do agree with you about that, but it's not irresolvable contradiction. It's contradiction that makes perfect sense when you think what these Athenians are doing. And the pathos gives them the solidarity of collective lamentation. But at the same time, they're getting rid of the bastards. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay, well, I, I mean, I'd be very happy to accept that, but I, I still want to um, say that there isn't much stress on the celebratory dimension at the end of the play. Well, we don't know, because okay. unfortunately, part of Dionysus' speech yeah. has been lost, and there are critics who say, oh, we don't know what happened. Yeah. Of, course he's, of course he founds the cult, and this is a good thing, and this, the, this is something to be welcomed. It is Thebes, of course, so you don't have the terrible sight of all these terrible things happening in Athens. But nevertheless, the cult is established because at the beginning of the play, he says, I have come to establish the cult. What he didn't say at the end of the play was, well, I was going to establish the cult, but on reflection, I don't think I'll bother. No, no, he establishes the cult, right? So that is positive. Thanks a lot for, for this question.
unfortunately we are running out of time for this um, session, so I think we should move on. Uh, okay. thank Professor uh, you can ask me afterwards. Oh, sorry. Uh, can we know, uh, last question or is uh, no, no, I think it was. Mm -hmm. so, good. Okay, so we move on. Thanks a lot, Professor Sifa, for you. Speaker, the next speaker has uh, also no need of presentation of introduction because he is very well known here. Uh, Darius Karlovitz is a philosopher, a university lecturer at the Warsaw University, and the editor and director of the Political Theology uh, Animal Review, um, a co organizer of this, <coughs> this conference together with the University of uh, Karlovitz of Warsaw. Um, he's also the president of the St. Nicholas Foundation and uh, he's a very well-known philosopher uh, in Poland and also uh, thanks to the translation of two of his books, uh, The Arch Paradox of Death, uh, Marxism as a, political, as a Philosophical Category, uh, and uh, Socrates and other things between this, also known to uh, European, uh, a wider European audience. Um, well, uh, Professor Carlos is going to uh, present a, a paper where who's whose title is The Return of Festus, uh, also related with uh, the political facet uh, of, uh, of the, the, the Dionysus quotes. And, uh, well, uh, I thank you very much, Professor Carlos, for your, for your contribution. Please, you have the microphone. Yesterday evening, during um, the Professor Sifo lecture, I realized that my paper might be one of answer why uh, tragedy and democracy appeared at the same moment, and it's strongly connected with the idea of of uh, uh, contradiction, with a contradiction, but with the question how to deal with a contradiction which appears, not to how to contemplate them. Or, many of um, critics uh, suggest, but uh, what to do in the reality in which contradiction appears. Uh, it appears that the overcoming of an internal conception of um, Dionysus, with, uh, which Cornelia Ischler Kerenny once called modern mythology, uh, has now become a fact which has occurred, if not in philosophy and the social sciences, then certainly in the field of the history of religion. The fascinating for several generations of scholars picture of a mad, barbaric, anti-political god of myth is being replaced by a picture much closer to historical reality of a protector of the police, a god those cult unites and strengthens the order of the political community. The change of paradigm is so drastic that we can worry whether the new view will not lose sight of the undebatable foreignness of a god whose paradoxical wisdom earned him a mantle of a god of madness, of a god whose action may consolidate order and give peace, but can also destroy those who, like the daughters of Minias or Proetus, will reject the calling to abandon their roles and question the absolute character of the principle that bind in the policy. It seems to me that the right road to answering the question about the political role of Dionysus is not from minimalizing the cult of alterity, foreignness and madness, clearly visible in the myth, but in the attempt to understand why the paradoxical god of wine and his seemingly anarchic calling can favor the preserving, consolidation, and even strengthening of the police. In this paper, I will concern myself with a story that it seems to me can be acknowledged as a type of mythological explanation of this puzzle, that is the history of a god's intervention that staved off the conflict between Hephaestus and Hera, and as a consequence, save an Olympus torn apart by a feud. It is a success of great measure. Dionysus overcomes one of the most serious crises of the world of the gods. 
It is a fact that in Attic painting from the first half of the sixth century before Christ, this is the only theme where Dionysus plays a central role. That's according to Carpenter. Uh, a fact allows us to suppose that the story played an important role in the forming of the, let's call it, theology of Semele's son. But did it play the same role for the forming of the Dionysian, let's call it, political theology? In fact, it would be difficult to point to a different mythical source of hope for writing the relation between the order of the polis and the strange demand of a mad god. The status of a myth is confirmed by the fact that it was the subject of the first of the six paintings that Pausanias saw in the Holy Circle of Dionysus, the traveler wrote. Within the precincts are two temples and two statues of Dionysus. Uh, there are paintings where Dionysus bring Hephaestus up to heaven. One of a Greek legend is that Hephaestus, then he was born, was thrown down by Hero. In revenge, he sent as a gift a golden chair with invisible fetters. Then Hera sat down, she was held fast, and Hephaestus refused to listen to any other of the gods save Dionysus. In him he reposed the fullest trust, and after making him drunk, Dionysus brought him to heaven. The Dionysian retinue with drunk Hephaestus carried upon the back of the Etiphalic mule a popular topic of a vase painting reminds us a completely different side of a Dionysus than the one we know from the myths of conflict featuring rebellious kings and the believers who have rejected the call. The place of the patron of an anarchic rebellion or a merciless avenger is instead occupied by a god in the role of keeper of the order of Zeus and pacifier, as Cornelia Ischler Kereny puts it in her fascinating sad. The effect of the god, if one submits to him, bring peace and return disturbed order. The scholar, uh, Professor Kereny, writes the following about the sin of the return of Hephaestus represented upon a famous black figure crater, so-called Francois Vaz, the oldest known realization of the team. And now it's a quotation. To understand the image, we need to avoid modern simplification. Considering Hira's rank in the cosmic order, her liberation cannot have been a purely comic episode, but a crucial event for the stability of the order. In this context, the role of Dionysus, who Cleitias placed intentionally at the center of a scene, is implied. His task is to reunite the disowned son with his mother and to reclaim Hera dignity as queen. Dionysus was responsible not only for reuniting peace to family, but for the re-establishment of a divine order. That's the end of a quotation from the civilizing violence. The accounts of uh, mythographers confirm the accuracy of this observation. The theme of chaos and division creeping into the world of the gods plays a substantial role from the very beginning of a Hephaestus story. The fact that uh, his birth was accompanied by dispute and range is said bluntly by Hesiod in his Theogony. The violation of a divine order is signaled, it seems, by both the problematic question of Zeus' fatherhood and uh, by the problem of the deformity of uh, God. Judging by Plato's rejection, the scandalous momentum of this conflict places it in the category of some of the most disturbing pictures in the ancient mythology. In the Republic, the philosopher recalls it as one of the two standard-bearing examples of stories harmful to the police, public morality and the right formation of youth. In other words, it is one of the reasons why myths, along with the creators, should be expelled from the state warfare of recognition of philosophy. The continuation of uh, the crisis is confirmed by news of the suffering of a child abandoned at Lemnos and the loving care of a daughters of Oceanus, whom are attempting to replace his birth mother, Hera. It is easy to understand that Hephaestus' revenge uh, by way of sending a gift 
in the form of a special throne trap as a desire or um, even out the accounts can be grasped as an attempt to measure out and restore justice. The attempt, as we know, work in the opposite way indeed, in, in, intended, and only increases the scale of the existing chaos. Justice can be measured, but it cannot be restored. The scale of stasis, the depth of the split dividing him and the house of the gods, is illustrated by a scene in which Hephaestus not only refuses to release of Hera, thereby going against her royal dignity, but also rejects the sacred in the eyes of a Greek's obligation of a son towards his parents. Pseudo Haginus writes that when Vulcan receives the request to refrain from revenge, the answer in, he, he answers in anger that he has no mother. He has no mother. There follows a series of unsuccessful attempts at resolving the conflict. This stage, let us call it pre-Dionysian, moves toward restoring order through the restoration of the Olympian Arche, understood as power and principle together, thus essentially toward the one-sided capitulation of Hephaestus. The failure of this approach seems very eloquent because it demonstrates an erroneous definition of the goal and the inadequacy of the methods for solving such a conflict as this. It is conflict those parties represent in common shareable reasons and therefore, or think they represent that kind of reasons, and therefore irreducible to any common scale. This is a situation that is tragic par excellence where on the one side we have the pain of a harmed child and on the other the drama of anarchy. On the one the scandal of injustice and on the other the disobedience. Although the attempt, the solution is served by a whole arsenal of political means, it has a misery, council and war, it does not facilitate the taking into account of Hephaestus' claim. Pausanias simply writes that um, Hephaestus did not want to show obedience to any of the gods. The goal of the intervention is clear. They are concerned with the full submission of the Hephaestus to the will of the gods. A similar assumption is confirmed by the account of Libanius, who informs us that the god of war, Aris, became unjudged in the resolution of the conflict. The council of the gods convinced that only Hephaestus is capable to frying his mother, gathers to discuss the question of his return to heaven. Aris takes the initiative since nobody else has any ideas for resolving the conflict. War seems to be the only way of returning order. However, the Aris intervention ends with spectacular failure, which will always haunt him with an air of infamy there be precisely outlining the limits of the effective power of that kind of action. The efforts of the gods come to naught. In the work of restoring order, both peaceful means, council and diplomacy, and the arcana of war turn out to be useless. The triumph of Dionysus become uh, unintelligible if we forget about all this. The matter proved to be impossible to resolve within the frame of the action previously undertaken. Only Dionysus, who gets the grief-stricken god drunk, succeeds in averting the crisis, that is by bringing Hephaestus from Lemnos to Olympus and leading him to reconcile with his mother. How does Dionysus achieve that other god could not? We do not know. The accounts of mythographer known to us are extremely restrained. They limit themselves to the lapidary information that the god make him drunk with wine. Despite this restraint, it would be difficult to see the matter as insignificant. It would be good to remember that it is after this adventure that Dionysus is admitted to the circle of the Olympian gods. Just so we are not misled by a story, coarseness. And he's admitted not as a one of a divine servants, but as one of the 12. 
that's very important information. The fact that it is then that a second class god, the only one in the group who is a son of a mortal mother, closes the list of the greatest god, can be also understood to mean that only after accepting Dionysus does Olympus, as a picture of a divine harmony, gain its final form. Without Dionysus, the order of the gods would be incomplete, or even, as the myth suggests, impossible. In what way, then, does the laconic made him drunk with wine shed light upon the role of Bacchus in the divine order of the world? To explain what lack Dionysus fills out, we should answer why does being drunk with wine make possibly restoring the unity torn apart by discord? Did Dionysus offer a previously unknown type of order in the manner of uh, Aeschylus' new order of Zeus, uh, some new perspective that permits the harmonization of contradiction of a Hegel kind? We know nothing about any of that. Upon what then does the power of salvic intoxication depend? Why and in what sense can drunkenness restore agreement <laughs> and the tragic discord and bond. If we accept that the coarse and comic rope of the myth express significant meanings, then it's worth to treat this seemingly frivolous history seriously. <coughs> However, this does not mean recasting the story into the bloodless allegory, but to see uh, where it will take us if we take it seriously without dismissing beforehand that it says something important about, about the world of the gods and men, not despite of its carelessness, but precisely through it. Since the episode is concerned with the god of wine, then submersion in everyday life should not be surprising. Is that true that the mythographers are restrained, but does that mean that they are hiding some mystery? But maybe the thing simply does not require additional explanation because the story is so obvious and universally known. If so, we should look for it in the genre specific potential of a scene, in the dialogue of a coarse voices warmed with wine, in the circulating imaginings caused by the soft powers of the cup filled with wine, with tempers, anger, filled disputes, resolves otherwise irreversible conflicts. If we agree that Dionysus is oinos, then without a great risk, we can also accept that the action of wine is in some sense analogical to the effect of a god's presence. This is a backbreaking task that goes way beyond the historian's workshop, definitely, but it's worth the risk. Without getting stuck in the cause details, but without escaping into badless abstraction, let us attempt to see what theological, ontological, and finally political meaning is carried by the image of Dionysus who unites the world. When we seek answers to the question as to what happened during the Council of the Gods, everything that was said about the salvic effects of the god and his gift comes to mind. That is everything that the picture of Oinos ties to the healing of Caris, bringing people together, liberation, agreement, peace, friendship, and love. There is plenty of this. The flip side of the horror accompanying the god in conflictual myths is, after all, countless coming from Homer to Hesiod witnesses tying to the god and wine with the bright side of a human life. As Homer, Zeus confesses, his son begotten of Semele is a source of a joy for mortals. With all the reservation which should be mentioned, Homer has no doubts that the wine is a divine, divine drunk and the wine is given of the earth. Hesiod calls Dionysus joyous, polygeteos, in his Theogony, and in his days and work repeats this description on the context of observation about the grape harvest. Very early in the Greek literature, there appears the obvious, anyway, observation that the gift of Dionysus is a kind of medicine which suits worries, gives comfort, 
frees from suffering and lets you forget about misfortunes. Low Bacchus, the best of all medicine, is to get drunk on wine. Remind us our cause. Thanks to Dionysus, disappear pain, woes, sadness, and worries, and their place is taken by the desire to dance and love. It is possible to doubt that the God's gift brings together and unites people, lovers, tension, melts, and eyes. Wine, says Plutarch, softness and smoothes characters so that it tries to mutual unity and friendship. This is obvious. However, in the connection of Oinos to peace, we can find deeper levels than in the banal and not always true statement that wine suits customs and judgments which Dionysus accomplishes as the patron of joy and serene social gatherings. The god who's calling, like uh, his gift, ignores social differences, puts in brackets hierarchies and dependencies. The god who questioned the apparently indisputability of the reasons justifying conflicts and wars get into the fundamental dispute a dispute about what is reasonable and what wisdom is. Dionysus says Euripides is a god who loves peace and equally without regard for wealth, distributes the joy of drinking wine without worries and shows himself to be an ardent enemy of false wisdom. He hates the one who does not care about this to lead a happy life by day and friendly night and to keep his wise mind and intellect away from an over-curious man. The sarcasm directed at the over-curious, uh, there lies, it seems to me, in the key to the question of wisdom, which Dionysus recommends to the Thebans in the back. The same, it seems, wisdom that allowed Dionysus to end the conflict between Hephaestus and Hera. Then what would be the wisdom to which the god calls, the wisdom of being drunk. The history of Hephaestus let us accept that what is reasonable in the Dionysian sense is what leads to the bonding of a world. That was marked by the unity of reason, but the unity of a world. The, an the antinomy of rational irrational in the Dionysian sense of the world correspond to the tension between the whole and the part, between what integrates and what divides. What is not included in the story, in the story about returning of Hephaestus, it also seems important to the story about Hephaestus. There is no final judgment. Deciding who was right, who was at fault. And there is no sentencing that restores the disturbed order. There is no punishment, and there is not even an attempt to explain the reasons of each one of the sides. They are absent in the order in which particular reasons move as do the means available to them. Because the conflict between Hera and Hephaestus is um, irresolvable, or they perceive it as irresolvable. What Dionysus lead to is a de-escalation, not a resolution. I borrow from the language of international relation to stress that the matter at hand is not about resolution which reinstitutes the whole as a consistent order, but as a state that makes coexistence possible for differing reasons and perspectives. De-escalation, a state engulfs a man whose members are warmed by wine, make it possible to break the impetus toward decomposition, maintain order and the wholeness of the world without making the verdict who won or who is right in the orders of power, logic, and the law. If Hephaestus can return to Olympus, if the divine and human order lasts, if between periods of wars and tensions, periods of peace appear and the whole does not fall apart, then it is because coexistence based upon de-escalation is possible, because it is possible to moderate conflict, 
independently of a logical or legal or political settling or dispute matter. The evaluation of the, whether mutual accusations are found and grievance independently of grievances and the scale of injustice committed. Dionysus does not bring about a new order, does not grant that one side is right, as Athena does in Oresteia, but proposes a practical solution. However, this solution requires the previous acceptance of a fundamental thesis. The thesis uh, that the world appears as tragic. This is the kind of ontological core of the myth of Hephaestus' return. Admittedly, history does not speak of this directly, but without this assumption, that the dispute ended hopes for a perfect ordering of the whole, the metaphor of getting drunk as a remedy for stasis does not make sense. The whole can only be reborn thanks to the assumption that disorder belongs to the nature of reality, that the whole can only be brought back under the condition of abandoning the hope for full unification. The helplessness of the gods apparent in the first pre-Dionysian phase of Hephaestus' story illustrates and confirms this thesis. The impossibility of bringing the whole world together under one arche is essential, so to say, in coherence, or rather its tragic nature, make it so that efforts to, re, uh, to recreate a whole free from disagreement, disobedience, and conflicting reason must be come to nothing. This is not exclusively about the obstinacy of the side. But will, will or uh, impetuosity, but about a fundamental undecidability about the conflict of incommensurate perspective, about a situation Whereas a scandalized Plato recounts in the Eutyphro that whatever is dear to Hephaestus is hated by Hera. This is why the Dionysian wisdom of the whole cannot be the wisdom of reason faithful to coherence and consistency. The acceptance of Dionysus to Olympus seems to be an acceptance of this diagnosis, the truth about the tragic nature of the world. Even in periods of a relative harmony, there always smolders the possibility of conflict that is irreductible to a common measure for opinions about beauty uh, or the good. There is always the possibility of situation in which all choices made in the logic of justice and treason uh, will be bad from the point of view of the integrity of the world or police. The acceptance of the got into company of a 12 seems to be an admission that the Dionysian epoche, the ability to put into brackets conflicting reason, is the condition sine qua non of all politics that take responsibility for the whole. Acknowledging that it is impossible to eliminate the tragic, those in power, both human and Olympian, must be able to mitigate conflict and to reduce its consequences. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Karlovic, for your <coughs> lightning uh, com conference. Uh, now we open uh, um, some time for questions. Or many, I mean, any anyone wants to start? I am um, well. Personally, I, if I can. <laughs> Ask something about this. Uh, I, I think the crisis of uh, Hephaestus and Dionysus is a key episode for the political relevance of Dionysus. In spite of what, what um, uh, Jean Mer said uh, in 1951 that Dionysus is an apolitical god, this is the most, um, the clearest uh, instance of political relevance in the reconciliation, the dialogue no, uh, of, of two factions of the city. No? This has been interpreted also in the Marxist uh, theory as a 
countryside and, and urban uh, classes, or I mean, there are many, many theories about, uh, even in mythology, no, I, um, I, I like especially this view of Eliade, of, uh, you know, how uh, Dionysus represents this breaking of, uh, of the um, politics, no, and the, for, the, for the necessary return by my, uh, my interest here is um, uh, what you mentioned in the last uh, uh, part of your conference uh, about um, how the city can, can heal wounds through Dionysus. I think this, uh, you can see this very well in Plato's Laws, uh, the last political, um, political uh, utopia of, of Plato uh, presents a, a sort of choir of Dionysus, uh, which is uh, basically an uh, old man, uh, drunk, uh, singing, and uh, Dionysiac uh, uh, lyric, uh, dithyramb, uh, and in some passage of, of the Laws, um, it seems like the legislature is the um, ultimate Dionysian um, um, dramatur, dra uh, drama writer, no? uh, and I, I, I wanted to ask you if you have if you, if you have con considered this uh, also this passage of um, um, I mean I think it's, uh, in Plato Dionysus is, is all around uh, Phaedrus and uh, Symposium of course, but uh, the, I think the political relevance of Dionysus um, in in Plato has been somewhat ne ne neglected, no, and we we don't take into account this um, that the, the last uh, attempt of reformation of the police, um, uh, well, uh, contains this this proposal, uh, which I think is um, somewhat related to this idea of Dionysus as a pharmacos, as a healing uh, um, uh, mediator or um, reconciliator, a dialectes, no, or of the police, no, I don't know. What do you what do you think about it? And, and another another thing I was um, thinking about uh, on this uh, preconception of of, um, um, of contradiction in, in Dionysus, uh, I, I wonder. I, I was reading also the list of uh, statements of of uh, Professor Seaford, and I was wondering uh, to which extent the idea of um, of Dionysus coming from outside the city, no, this, um, I don't know, in the myth of, of Ephesus is there, no, um, this um, idea that the, uh, the, the, the very Greeks had, uh, that he was a foreign god, no, and uh, that Nietzsche also had, no, uh, Ro uh, Erwin Rode had this idea of, uh, of Dionysus being foreign, uh, coming from uh, all the German scholars from the 19th century thought that it was uh, this mysticism, this kind of ecstatic religion was not Greek, not Indo-European, etc. No? Um, well, it plays a, ro a very important role also in these um, preconceptions of Dionysus, in a way. No, I don't know what you what you think. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, the the, the, f the, f the first topic it's a huge, huge, huge subject. Uh, it's a huge subject. It's a question of a relation between Plato and and, and, and Dionysus, and uh, especially in the um, in the laws. Uh, my feeling that it's uh, the, um, that Pl Plato has a fund fundamental problem with uh, Dionysus because. Uh, 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 the acceptance of um, uh, contradiction in the reality is a border where he can't pass by. So his problem with Dionysus is a problem with something which transcends the logic of a police and on, of, of a thought. And he, um, he, he disaccepts it. Uh, my feeling is that that's what we see in law. It's a way how he's trying to use a power a power mm, of Dionysus, but as an immanentized god. I mean, that's a power of immanentization. He wants to read, to, to put Dionysus into the logic, uh, not, I mean, to avoid a risk of a, of a presence of a god who transcended logic. So, of course, he's less. Uh, um, mm, Less, uh, but it's a, it's it, it, it's a genre. I mean, he's not as uh, openly against as as he's in 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 in, in Republic, um, but it's a difference of a tone, not of um, logic. That's that's my that's my feeling, and it's quite clearly visible in the Utifro, where we have. Uh, Discussion in where no one really represented the the, 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 the traditional religion, because Eutyphro it's uh, it's a man of straw, because he he takes from uh, the, uh, mm, mm, 
from a, he, he borrowed the idea of a conflict of gods, but he uh, disagree on the concept that something may be um, uh, may be contradict in itself because of a different point of view of gods. So uh, I mean, he's quite easy is in that discussion because, I mean, he, from the beginning, he gave a white flag. Mm. The, the second question, it's even bigger topic. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, probably that's, that's, that's a blessing that we can talk about the Dionysus avoiding that problem, what Professor Seaford mentioned on the very beginning on his first comment to uh, Professor Kerani speech that um, that's a question of of that very strange situation that uh, Greek created a situation in which a part of a culture was something which signalized that it's that that doesn't belong fully to the all the metaphors of a citizen and stranger of um, gods and uh, human. Uh, 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 of um, of a child of a strong contradiction, strongest contradiction possible, uh, Semele and Zeus, uh, Persephone and Zeus, the Met and Zeus. Uh, um, his uh, field where those contradictions met. met, met. Uh, and I think he represents a kind of a power of a integration of the holiness of that what's holy, not what's united, but what's everything. I mean, that's that's a kind of, a, I think, an essence of uh, the deity, if, if the answer is fulfilling yes. your... Professor Sifo. Yeah. Yes, what you say very interestingly puts in my mind the question of the effectiveness of Dionysus as an integrating force in the archaic and classical period, whether that is an idea or whether it is embodied merely in practice. What, what I mean by that is that, for example, in the early vase paintings of the return of Hephaestus, quite often there are satyrs in the procession. Now that's very significant because in various ways, one of the ways is that, of course, it looks as if that was a, a, a performance through the streets of, a, of, of, a, of cities, that every year this was a little a myth that was enacted and that people dressed up as satyrs and participated in it. A, a second respect in which it's interesting, of course, is that some kind of performance like that, if we believe Aristotle's account of early tragedy, which I do, played some role in the evolution of tragedy because Aristotle uh, is, talks about that is tosa terikon, the thing from which tragedy develops with all its integrative and political significance. But this, I mean, raises a general question about how integration occurs in the classic and archaic polis. Um, Dionysus is really present in these... Uh, uh, situations, or generally, in this early period, not 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 as an idea, but simply as a, a, a god who inspires and demands certain practices. I mean, later, of course, Dionysus does become an idea. For example, in Neoplatonism, Dionysus is an idea. The fall of Dionysus, the dismemberment of Dionysus, becomes a philosophical uh, category, which Plotinus gives us uh, the, the, the fragmentation of the psyche and so on, and its fall to the lower level. So Dionysus eventually becomes a philosophical idea, but in the early period, he's just imagined as this force that inspires practice. And then the question is, how does practice integrate? And it, in one possible answer is that one has to think of a definition of ritual as the enactment of things as they should be, as opposed to the messiness and the disorder of things as they actually are. So ritual is controlled action, 
control is desired in action, and ritual is perfectly controlled action. That is why it is an enactment of things as they should be. But then the point is here is that that enactment then reacts back onto everyday life, reacts back onto the messiness of political life and everyday life by maintaining itself in the memory of the participants or the spectators of the action. So that Dionysiac ritual, whether it's a mystic initiation, whether it's a procession of satyrs through the street bringing Hephaestus back to Olympus, uh, whether it's some other kind of procession, whether it's a drama, um, whatever it is, acts to integrate the community by virtue of providing a paradigm of perfectly cohesive action which stays with people even in their political conflicts. I mean, that's why I mentioned that passage from Xenophon where the herald of the Eleusinian Mysteries says we shouldn't be fighting, we're all, we're all share participation in the Eleusinian Mysteries. He's reminding them of their shared participation in a ritual. So, I mean, it's just that my, my instinct in these things is to, as it were, privilege action over ideas. I and mean, at the same time, there are some, in the choruses of the Bacchae, there are ideas about what Dionysus does. So it's not as if there are no ideas, but they're very, always very closely related to action, in particular, the kind of ritual action as I conceive it. I don't know what you think of all that. Yes, definitely, definitely. I, uh, I, uh, I use that uh, myth because uh, uh, we don't have enough of material to say when we're trying to restore so-called theology or political theology of a cult. Uh, uh, in using both myths and rituals is much, say, I think, much more universal. Of course, that's a small paper, but I do agree that uh, the kind of a practical exercise, uh, you wrote an excellent chapter in your, in your book on Dionysus about the, the creating a community. Uh, during uh, uh, the festivals of uh, uh, of uh, Dionysus, I understand it as a, as a kind of a looking for a lowest common denominator. That what is uh, exercise done by uh, uh, during a special anterior i think and uh, and uh, uh, and the small dionysian dionysia that uh, uh, dionysus uh, he closed a theater so all the uh, personaggi del teatro were only people that's uh, that's i think a sense of that exercise which i think it's a kind of a practical political epoche. That's a chance which a secular societies feel a strong lack. It's a reset. It's a kind of an ontological reset. That's, I think, an essence, the epoche, a kind of epoche. We see that the problem is, who is the Dionysian human being? Because in the eyes of uh, philosophical anthropology, he's nothing more than an animal. That's, that's a problem, I think, which is uh, incorporated in the thinking on uh, Dionysian epoche, that the common de denominator uh, is beyond a human identity. That's, I think, one of the uh, biggest problem of that anthropology, which is but that's another question. But I fully agree that, uh, that festivals are uh, much more important from the point of view of political reality than the myth. The only interesting thing is that, uh, that, that, that piece of Pausanias uh, I've read shows six pictures of, uh, uh, connected with uh, Dion, Dionysus. And the first, it's uh, returning from uh, to Olympus. Second is Lycurgus. Third is uh, third is Penteus, 
and then three is about Ariana. Three is about Ariana. So we have a hope of reconciliation, a risk of rebel, of a stupid rebel, and the story of follower who shows whom is the person who, who follow Dionysus. The Dionysus give a hope of creating non-political identity. That's a very strange thing, because nature of anything in Greece, it's a telos. Answering what's a nature is answering what's a telos. Telos of a human being is a politics. Uh, what kind of telos has Ariadna? She's expelled from politics. Absolutely. He is, uh, as Shakespeare took it in the Coriolanus, she's a kind of nothing. She's a kind of nothing. I mean, who would be the identity, who would be a person who is not political? That's a story on the, say, other paper, probably. <laughs> But I think that taste gave um, uh, festivals you, you, you've mentioned, and that practice, that answer, that we are something a part of being political. I mean, uh, but we can design what is it that a political zone only on the basis of uh, apophatic anthropology. We can say who is not a, a political zone. But we can't say who is it. That's answer. Thank you. Thank you. Any other um, question? So, thanks a lot, Professor Carlos, for your contribution. And um, we move on. Uh, I think we have a break now. Thank you. Let's have now like a shorter break, like four, like 15 minutes.